I was in opposition to this bill because I believe it contains language that would allow American citizens to be detained without trial. Now, the other side has argued that that isn't true, that you will be eligible for your constitutional rights if you get into an Article III court or a constitutional court. But here's the rub. You have to be eligible. Who decides whether you're eligible for the court or not? It's an arbitrary decision, and this is what this debate has been over. So don't let the wool be pulled over your eyes to think that you have a protection and that you will get a trial by jury if accused of a crime. We had protection in this bill. We passed an amendment that specifically said if you're an American citizen or here legally in the country, you would get a trial by jury. It was explicitly stated and it's been removed in the conference committee. It's been removed because they want the ability to hold American citizens without trial in our country. This is so fundamentally wrong and goes against everything we stand for as a country that it can't go unnoticed and should be pointed out. Now, proponents of indefinite detention without trial say that an accusation alone is sufficient, that these crimes are so heinous that trials are unnecessary. They will show you pictures of foreigners in foreign dress from foreign lands and say that that's what this debate is about. It is untrue. This debate is about American citizens accused of crimes in the United States. Make no mistake that the faces of terrorism include awful people who should be punished to the full extent of the law. But the same portrait of evil could be drawn of domestic terrorists, of domestic terror and domestic violence. One could parade pictures of Charles Manson, of Timothy McVeigh, the Oklahoma bomber, of Jeffrey Dahmer. And people would cry out that they don't deserve a trial either. But when we think about it, when most Americans understand at some level that when you're accused of a crime in our country, you get a trial. You get a trial by a jury of your peers, no matter how heinous your crime is, no matter how awful you are, we give you a trial. This bill takes away that right and says that if someone thinks you're dangerous, we'll, we'll hold you without a trial. It's an abomination. It should not stand. Most Americans understand that you are accused of a crime doesn't make you guilty of a crime. You get your day in court. Now some here may not care when they determine that they're going to detain Ahmed or Yusuf or Ibrahim, but many Americans and innocents are named Ahmed and Yusuf and Ibrahim. Many Americans are named Saul or David or Isaac. Is our memory so short that we don't understand the danger of allowing detention without trial? Is our memory so short that we don't understand the havoc that bias and bigotry can do when unrestrained by law? Your trial by jury is your last defense against tyranny, your last defense against oppression. We have locked up Arabs, we have locked up Jews, we have locked up the Japanese. Do you not want to retain your right to trial by jury? Do you want to allow the whims of government to come forward and lock up who they please without being tried? In our not too distant past, Americans named Ozaki or Ichiro or Yuki were indefinitely detained by the tens of thousands without trial, without accusation. Will America only begin to regret our loss of trial by jury when the people have names like Smith and Jones? When the only constant in life is change, you need to be ready. This is the Man Made Survival Show. Hello everyone, my name is Jose Prado with Memory Survival. Thank you so much for coming back to the channel and watching this video. I really do appreciate it because this video is the third part of this series that I'm doing about the economy, about what is going on with the food inflation and what's going on with the government and what is going to be going on here in the future. So I really do encourage you not only to stay all the way to the end of this one, but if you have not already, to go back and listen to the first one. 
because all of this information is part of a bigger picture that I'm putting together for you so you can understand everything that's going on all at once because you know there, there's so much information coming out so often that um the, a lot of people are getting information overload and they're just throwing their hands up in the air and they're just saying forget it or they're just focusing on one of the issues from all the many issues that are going on all at once here in the u.s and not only in the u.s but all throughout the world so i really do encourage you to go back and listen to it all right so the first one that you that the first podcast that i did was about the food inflation and how um not only are the poor countries in the world suffering but China is on the brink of food crisis, and so are we here in the United States with the food inflation and how the farmers are being affected because of weather and because of uh, China overbuying all our, pro our produce. And all that is tied together also with the economy, with everything that we're printing, with all the money that we're doing, with everything that we're going to be giving away or, you know, the government is giving away. Um, and how all of that is working to where all the other countries are paying attention to everything that we're doing with the monetary policy. And they're looking for ways to look for another world reserve currency, which China has positioned itself to be the next one. The one that's going to be running all over the world, especially with the with the Belt and Road Initiative that they have done. Since they have all this, this infrastructure all around the world, it's going to be easier for them to implement the system where those countries are going to have to use the Chinese uh, cryptocurrency there. And then not only the, the African countries and the South American countries are going to be part of that, but also that e, the EU is going to be compelled to go to to the Yuan and adopt it as the world reserve currency, as opposed to what the United States has been doing since the 1940s. All right. And because of all of that, it's going to create a hyperinflation scenario for us here in the U.S. so fast that it's going to make our, fit, our heads spin. So I really do hope that you listen to those two, two um, podcasts because this one is also tied to that, okay? And as you heard as I started this podcast, we started with Ron Paul and what he had to say about uh, the NDAA, which is the National Defense Authorization Act, all right? This issue has been here in the American mind for decades now, all right? Technically, since 2001, um, you know, we had the Patriot Act and then the natural, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act came along. And then, you know, it, it keeps getting signed. Trump signed it and even updated it to certain things. So the idea of having the government treat Americans as, as terrorists has, it's, not a, it's not a new concept. It's a concept that has been here for, for decades now. So... We have to pay attention. And yes, this is all connected, even though it seems like, you know, talking about food inflation and the economy, talking about the, the domestic affairs of the United States kind of makes it seem like it's a left turn or, you know, a hard turn from from the uh, from the other issues. I can promise you that all of this is um, all of this goes together. So please share this information with your friends and family. Uh, please visit the the, uh, the store, memesurvivalstore.com. And on there, not only can you find everything that you're going to need for preparedness, but also uh, we're giving a book away for free. You're going to see it on the front page and it's going to it, and it's a book that you can get for yourself and your family. You know, you can get it and share it. The book is absolutely free. All I need your help is with shipping. The, the book retails for $24.99 and the shipping is $9.99. So you are, in fact, getting it for free. So I would really appreciate it if you can go on there, get um, get the book and then share it with friends and family. The same thing about this podcast that I've been sharing this entire week. All these podcasts are very important, okay? And it's very important that we reach more people so they can get prepared for the things that I've been talking about this entire time. And it would be, it would, for me, it would be very disappointing to have all these things happen and not reach more people. So I really need your help with that. If you cannot help me through patreon.com and making a donation or you know buying something from the store at least help me with this with sharing this information leaving a comment subscribing to the channel from whatever social media you may listen to this through and you know make it known that this podcast this community of preppers are taking steps baby steps to get into a greater goal of uh, of getting many people prepared not just here in the united states but all throughout the world and we can only do that with your help by sharing this podcast. 
All right, so why did I start with with a, an old video of, of Ron Paul, uh, you know, talking about the NDAA? The reason is because in the Obama years, we talked about a lot and we heard a lot about uh, indefinite detention of American citizens. And it was a big deal in those days, and I do believe it's going to be a big deal now. The only difference is that in those days, it was more focused with people outside the United States. And they were trying to bring it into the United States, and people were standing up. They did not have any type of excuse, the government, to try to make the same laws for terrorists outside the United States as terrorists in the United States, you know, or for, for citizens, rather. Because there was no event that happened, you know, there was no real threat. But now that what happened in January 6, it's kind of like the, the, the foot in the door of bringing the old way of thinking, the old NDAA, you know, into into what's happening today. So I do want to do I do want to say, though, it is not something that they are implementing, but they are talking about it. You know, the rhetoric is very strong right now coming from the from the mainstream media, coming from from government itself and from people who used to be in the government about how what how things should be handled ever since January 6. So if we do not pay attention to these things and if we do if we don't make our voices heard that that should not go that direction, then it's going to be a very strong persecution in the United States. And that's not involving, you know, other countries that want to to mingle in this and, and you know, like the World Economic Forum or, or anything like that. That's just the government itself trying to trying to implement something that they couldn't do years ago. So the first headline that I have for you is about guns, because I do believe guns is going to be one of those things that's going to make the American people rise up. Now, I'm not advocating for for violence or anything like that. All I'm simply what I'm doing is I'm looking at what's going on, the headlines that are coming out from the mainstream media and thinking critically of how things can can unfold. Right. Because we can look in the past, see what happened. We can uh look into what's going on right now and both of those put together we can look at what could happen in the future you know that's just critical thinking that's just an analysis and that's what i'm doing in this podcast so i really do think that we need to not only listen to all of this and do our own research but really look into what way the government is going to be taking this to all right so even though nothing happened nothing really happened on january 6th whether, you know, it was Trump or not, all of that, it doesn't matter. What matters is the outcome of it. And even though the American people didn't really do anything that day, nothing major really happened. It doesn't mean that that violence that was avoided on January 6th would not spring back up or would spring up in the future. You know, with with jobs being lost, with the with the food being too expensive, and now with guns being controlled to the point where nobody can afford them, all right? Because, you know, they're not taking them away from you, saying, you know, give it to me because I said so. They're going to tax the crap out of it to where you cannot even afford to buy ammo, all right? So that, that is the issue that we're, that we're going to be seeing here in the next few few days, maybe in the next few weeks, months, maybe in the years. I don't know how long this may last, but the point is that if this continues to happen in the in the measures that they're pushing for do go through, then we're going to be experiencing a lot of things in the United States. So please understand that now there's no reason for them not to be able to pass the gun laws. There's no reason for them to pass all the stimulus that they want. There's no reason for them not to pass any radical agenda because now, you know, everybody on the left controls the House, the Senate and the presidency. So all three branches of government are being controlled by, by one party at the very least for the next 24 months. So we really have to pay attention and be um, mindful of the things that is, that is being said, that is being shared, and how the mainstream media and government officials are talking about all of this. All right, so the headline comes from the, free, the freethoughtproject.com. And the headline says, biggest gun control bill in history targets the poor will make millions of felons overnight. And I do want to say that this is going to be a little bit longer. You know, this is one of the bigger or the longer articles that I've shown to you so far. So please listen to it and stay all the way to the end. 
HR-127, known as Sabika Sheikh Firearms Licensing and Registration Act, introduced by Representative Jackson Lee Sheila, district uh, or Democrat from Texas, is without a doubt the most tyrannical gun con control bill ever proposed. Like all gun control measures, this bill would hit the poor and minority communities the hardest. Its massive scope would also turn tens of millions of legal law-abiding gun owners into felons overnight. In a post to Facebook, Cohen narrowed down some of the bill's most ominous points that would target every single gun owner in the country. Firearms license required for any, gun, any new gun purchase or ownership transfers. Licensee must be 21 years old, complete a 24-hour gun safety training course, and must undergo a psych evaluation, right? I do want to pull back from that for just a second. And I think I'm going to, you know, hit point, point by point so we can have a broader understanding of this. So in some aspects, what they want to do, you know, it does kind of make sense. You know, it, when, when you think of it logically, you say, well, you know, that makes sense. And you can go through each and every one of these and say, well, this one doesn't apply to me, so I don't have to worry about it. And that one doesn't either. You know, I'm a law-abiding citizen. But then when it gets down to to certain aspects of the weapon, the ammo, and the taxes, that's when a lot of people, I believe, are going to revolt because of it. All right? And as I mentioned, there is no reason for this not to pass since Democrats um, are pretty much in control of the entire government at the moment. The article goes on to say... <clears throat> Multi-tier license, individual license for ownership and display of antique firearms, standard firearm license, and military-style license. Military license require additional 24-hour safety course. Licensing is revoked immediately for anyone indicted of a crime of which the sentence lasts longer than one year. I, I want to pull back for a second and say, you know, that kind of makes sense. The, um, the military license require additional 24-hour safety course. You know, people can argue that that makes sense because that's what people are, you know, people on the left are saying. But that's just another fee. That's another expense that somebody would have to commit to if they want to keep the firearm. And then they're talking about somebody who has to go to prison for one year for whatever it is. Then they will get the guns taken away, and then, you know, in some in some uh, degree, that makes sense because who goes to prison? You know, typically people who pretty much commit crimes. So you can check off the list and say, "Well, I don't commit crimes," so you would feel like that would not uh, affect you in any way. The money part of it is that it might, and you might not like that. All right. So the article goes on to say. This heavily discriminates against anyone who has ever seen a therapist or had to get a mental health treatment, such as victims of abuse and people with depression and veterans seeking care for PTSD. Depression and addiction are mentioned specifically as reasons for licensing denial. Also, gun licensing, gun licensing is expensive, which makes, which makes ownership less accessible for those who need their own protection most. All right, before I continue on... Um, it has always been, for as long as I can remember, the left has said that they would want to keep people who are mentally ill, you know, keep guns from people who are mentally ill. And again, that makes sense when you think about it. But they are going to cast a wide net into people who cannot have a gun, you know. So now the number of people that can have a gun in, uh, decreases greatly because of this wide... Um, net that has been casted over all of this and you know it will be to the discretion of the of the psychologist psychiatrist or whoever that would evaluate you to say whether or not you are mentally fit you know somebody can just pay them off and say whoever comes to your office you're just going to deny them so there's a lot of potential for abuse and discrimination and corruption into this bill when you get other third party involved rather than just you know the government directly to the to the uh, the citizens and even though even if it's just the government there's a lot of corruption involved all right so here comes the next part of this article requires an 800 dollars annual government insurance fee for all current and future gun owners to be paid to the attorney general every year there is no grandfather clause 
meaning this applies to anyone that owns a gun at all, not just those who purchase a new firearm after this passes. This fee will certainly go up each year. It's yet another barrier for those in poverty to be able to defend themselves. All right, so I want to I wanna talk about that real quick. You know, it requires $800 annual government insurance fee. And, you know, you could actually save $66.66 a month in order for you to be able to pay the, the fee. But that would also include the licensing to the, whatever degree that they have. You know, first you have the regular gun and then they have the military style uh, license. And in no doubt, they're going to get expensive because in, if they're going to put certain farms in the same category as they do, uh, you know, silencers and other types like that, those those um, those applications and those licenses are very, very expensive. And the reason that they do that is to discourage people from actually getting a, you know, a silencer and other stuff like that. And people who right now, right, like I mentioned, all of this is connected with the economy, with food inflation, because if the economy is going to tank, even more, and then more people are unemployed and all of these things are going on, all those guns are gonna be taken away from all those people almost immediately. So you see how all of this is connected? All right, also it says that there will be no grandfather clause. So even if you do have a firearm right now, you will still, starting whenever that is implemented, the year after that for you to pay the $800. That's, that, it doesn't say that you would have to pay the $800 when it first gets implemented. You know, you know what I'm saying? So if right now you don't have $800 to just spend for you to get the licensing of one of your guns and then for the other ones, then it's going to get expensive very fast. Now, they don't say if it's going to be one fee for one gun and then one license per gun or is it going to be like one blanket, you know, type of licensing. I guess we're going to have to wait and see. Uh, the... Article goes on to say, mandatory nationwide firearm registration and database. All firearms owned shall be registered under penalty of up to $150,000 and 15 years in prison. Serial, make, model, date, identity of owner, and the location of where the firearm will be stored to be collected and maintained in a database by the U.S. Attorney General. Names and information of all those who may have access to the firearm shall be collected as well. This, inf this information can be accessible by state, local, and federal police, military, as well as state and local governments. All right, before I move on to the next section of this, all right, when he says that it would be a penalty of $150,000 and 15 years in prison, whatever happened to uh, cruel and unusual punishment? Who in the world can afford $150,000? And who would want to spend 15 years in prison for not registering the firearms? Whether it's a firearm that you built yourself, so, you know, quote unquote, it's a ghost gun, or one that you buy at a gun shop or whatever it may, it may be, or whatever you already have. You know, you may have bought it from someone you knew years ago, and but now they're going to make sure that you do it because if for whatever reason, your neighbor calls the the uh, the police saying that you have a firearm because you know of a red flag law, and they come in and they see that you have all these unregistered weapons. You're gonna spend 15 years in prison, more than likely per gun that you have in there, and maybe the 150 thousand dollars per gun as well. So for that from that point on, you pretty much spend the rest of your life in prison. And even if you do get out because of good behavior, you're still gonna have all this debt. On top of you so what are you going to do they're compelling every citizen to look at these facts and say you know the risk are too great so that's gonna do one of two things one is gonna make people very angry to where they will go to the streets and do something about it which again I'm not I'm not calling for it I'm just you know making the analysis or two they're gonna have to turn in their firearms they're gonna register them and or do whatever else the government says that they want them to do very important that we pay attention to the little details. Uh, also, the name, the name of the information of the people who may have access to it. I mean, what are they going to make sure that you're that um, strangers down the street are also have their their names collected? What about your neighbor? I mean, they might have access to it if, if you're not at home and they just, you know, walk into your house and, and try to take it away. I mean, 
how far does that go? You know, more than likely, they're just talking about, you know, immediate family members like a brother, a sister, you know, an uncle, something like that. But the point is that they're making sure that everyone who's going to be around that gun, probably inc including children, will have their name in the database as potential people who can have a firearm. Um, the information will be accessible by the state, local, federal police, military, as well as state and local governments. All right. the the uh, The article also goes on to say, and this is the this is the more, um, I guess you can say the more draconian part of all of this, because even if they do away with all the licensing and all the fees and all of that, if they do a ban on certain ammunition or the fees for the ammunition go a lot greater, or the taxes of it are so expensive that it's just difficult for you to even get ammo, you know, let alone practice, then you can see how all of this will make a lot of people very angry very quickly. There would be a ban on 50 caliber and larger ammunition outright. Ammunition and magazine bans. Uh, bans on all mags that hold more than 10 rounds. This ammo is mostly used for hunting and is rarely used against people. The most common handgun and rifle use magazines that exceed the arbitrary limit, which makes tens of millions of law-abiding gun owners felons overnight. Uh, and the last one says, illegal ownership for even a single round of banned ammo will result in up to a $100,000 fine and or 20 years in prison. Okay, so they did say, you know, the 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 Biden administration when they were going when they were um, doing the campaign, they said that they would do some type of buyback um, program where citizens could either a go and sell their, their guns back to the government, and more than likely this will include include ammo. All right, that would mean that the government would have to spend even more money. But, of course, they're going to buy it on very, very cheap. And two, that will force everybody else who wants to keep their guns, who do have the ability to pay all the fees, all the licensing and all of that, to register the guns. And the number of Americans who are going to be able to possess a firearm is going to decrease exponentially. All the, all the re record-breaking number of people who have been buying guns, you know, last year and this year, all those the same people are going to have to be or the, the same people are going to have to turn the guns back in. So just as we saw a record buying spree, more than likely if this passes through and nobody fights it, you know, the NRA is unable to fight it. The, the GOP is unable to fight it. We're going to see a great sell off to the government. And only a handful of people will be able to keep it. You know, I guess it all depends on what the final price tag is going to be on all the licensing, on all the fees, on all the things that they're trying to do. All right, so I guess we're going to have to wait and see. But like I said, now there's no excuse for them not to be able to do it for the simple reason that they control the government now. All aspects of government. They control the House, the Senate, the presidency. They also control the courts. They control some local governments and even some state governments. So they, it wouldn't be very difficult for them to be able to do something like this. Now, of course... Some states have come out and say that they will not comply, that they will make um, whatever Biden's federal law that is unconstitutional be void and uh, null and void. But that's just going to create more problems. Also, this has been like Texas has said that they will become a sanctuary city for guns, meaning that everybody around the country will have to move to Texas and any other state that would back Texas into it or you know back Texas with that type of declaration and North Carolina now I didn't think about it or no no North Dakota so we have to really pay attention to all of this and look at what the reality is going to be later on so again how many people are going to get angry about all of this that's going on or that could be potentially be going on we have to pay attention to all of that we have to make sure that we understand what we are seeing for the future all right that's what i meant when i said that we can look at what is what happened in the past what's going on now and we can critically think what's going to happen in the future let's take those steps of critical thinking all right so 
I want to go ahead and bring this, on, bring this back to January 6th because there has been a lot of rhetoric about what happened today and all the things that the mainstream media has been saying because there are some out there who are going just completely bonkers about what they are saying about the GOP, the Republican Party, and, and you know, Trump supporters and everybody with white skin. And it's really crazy how they're taking it. But the fact that they're talking about it with other white people goes to show how how radical and how critical things are becoming. So you have to make sure that you follow that closely, all right, because of this next headline that I have for you. Lawmakers mauled the domestic terrorist statue in wake of January 6th attack. That's from the Hill.com. Lawmakers indicated interest in enacting a new domestic terrorist statue on Thursday in light of the January 6th attack on the Capitol despite warnings from civil rights groups that such a law would be used to target a broader group of Americans. Quote, we will begin to shed light on why these warnings were not heeded. The irrefutable fact is that the threat of right wing and more specifically white nationalist terrorism has been growing for years. The reason that that is very important is because that's coming from lawmakers. And I encourage you to grab that headline, go to thehill.com, look it up or Google it and read the entire article and read the entire article because I'm only giving you a very small snippet of the entire thing because really what the whole article is about is how many lawmakers have the same type of feeling and feeling and thinking about the issue that happened on January 6th. All right, because we both know, you and I both know that they did not care what happened during the summer last year. All the buildings being burned down, all the stuff being looted, they did not care. The only time they care is when people broke down into the into the um, into the Capitol, into the office, into you know the Senate and all that. That's when they cared. The same thing happened with Chad and Chaz, or Chop, I mean. Chop and Chaz. <clears throat> the uh the where was it? Was it Poland? No, I think it was Seattle. Anyways, one of those cities where Chad had established an autonomous zone, the local government did not give a rib about what happened in the streets. How many people died? How many people were, were being threatened? The police being hurt? They did not care until the same people marched to the governor's home and they graffitied the place. They threatened to come in. And, you know, doing all those uh, demonstrations the very next morning, the very next morning, the police came through with riot control gear, with the uh, with the uh, riot control vehicles. And they took down Chop or Chaz in a matter of minutes. So be nights before and weeks before that, and even after the after the fact, the police teeth were taken from them. You know, they were they were an attack bug without no teeth. But as soon as the government in that city was threatened, then they put the teeth back on the police. The police came in. They did what they had to do. They got everybody out, away from there and then they got rid of it. That's exactly the same approach that they're taking to all of this. All right. So now I do want to go into the next article. Oh, actually, I have a video to show you. But before I say that, all right. I do want to say, and I want to make sure that you understand, because I do feel this sense of responsibility to you because you are my audience. You know, uh, about 10,000 of you who listen to this podcast every day, every month, I really do feel a sense of, um, of responsibility to tell you the following. You're going to have to be very careful on the things that you post on social media the things that you tell your fellow Americans in your own community, because the steps that the government wants to take and how they're talking about things and not only them, but the mainstream media and people who used to be in office and or some type of government um, agency, the way that they're talking about all these issues is very um, troubling. Because we never thought we would see this day come. Even though they were they were threatening it decades ago, now it has come to the United States. So 
the video that I'm gonna show you is probably something that you already have listened to and you already heard, but pay very close attention because I, I kind of took something from there that she said, that this person said, and I haven't really heard anybody else say it or, you know, come on to it. So hopefully you listen to it and you and hopefully, you know, I'm not misinterpreting what this person is saying, but, you know, let me know in the comment section. All right, here's that video. And again, it's not us yeah. saying so, John Hammond. That is a bulletin released to all law enforcement earlier this week that there is, until the end of April, a persistent threat of domestic extremism, domestic uh, terrorism carried out in the ideology and around this belief that the election um, was fraudulent, that the COVID restrictions are unnecessary. All of those ideologies pushed by Donald Trump. But, but my question for you is around incitement. Um, we had a policy, and it was very controversial. It was carried out under the Bush years and under the Obama years of attacking terrorism at its root, of going after and killing, um, and in the case of Amr al awlaki an American, a Yemeni American, with a drone strike for the crime of inciting violence, inciting terrorism. Mitch McConnell was in the Senate then. He was in the Senate after 9-11, too. How does Mitch McConnell, who understands that the way you root out terrorism is to take on, in the case of Islamic terrorism, kill those who incite it, how does he not vote to convict someone that he said on the floor of the Senate incited an insurrection? Do you hear it, too? Do you hear what she said? She's talking about drone strikes against American citizens. Drone strikes here in the United States. But not only that, the part that I caught, like when I was listening to this and I kind of ponder on it and, you know, try to digest what the heck she was saying, is the fact that she's saying that in the Middle East, with Islamic terrorism, you know, they would get killed. They, get, they would kill the root of the problem. People who incited violence of terrorism or whatever. And then she shifted to Mitch McConnell about um, in, indicting Donald Trump. But if she is putting incitement of violence with killing the root of it, does that mean that she wants Trump to be killed? Because to me, that's what it sounded like. So let me know in the comment section if I took if if I misunderstood that, if I um you know I'm looking too much into it. But my point is this: if they were to kill Trump, how many people would rise up? And that's exactly what they're saying. That's exactly what they're talking about in this next article that I want to read to you, because we really have to pay attention on the group of people who are going to be alienated here in the next few weeks, here in the next few months, in the next few years. Because if in the past, the NDAA was such a, such a bill that was bringing a lot of attention, not only to the people in Congress or in the Senate, but Americans all across the country with just the thought, the possibility of having such a bill, how are we going to react now that we're going to have something like this more than likely um, passed because of what happened on January 6th? Because let me remind you, they did not have any type of excuse back in those days for them to implement something like that. It was all on the basis of what if. But now that January 6th happened, it's going to be, they're going to use that. They're going to milk it as much as they can on what happened on, on January 6th. And then they're going to implement certain laws because of that. And they're, they're taking the opportunity to be able to alienate a lot of people here in the country. All right. The next thing that I have for you comes from Summit.News. CIA counterterror chief suggests going to war against domestic insurgents. The former head of the CIA counterterrorism center has suggested that counterinsurgency tactics used by the military in Iraq and Afghanistan should be applied to domestic extremists inside of the U.S. NPR reports that Robert Greener, who directed the CIA counterterrorism program from 2004 to 2006, declared, quote, we may be witnessing the dawn of a sustained wave of violent insurgency within our own country, perpetrated by our own countrymen, end quote, in an op-ed 
For the New York Times last week, Greener suggested that, quote, extremists who seek a social apocalypse are capable of producing endemic political violence of a sort not seen in this country since Reconstruction, end quote. Greener, also a former CIA station chief in Pakistan and Afghanistan, grouped together, quote, the Proud Voice, the Three Percenters, the Oath Keepers, Christian National Chauvinist, White Supremacist, white supremacist and QAnon fantasist, end quote, and claim that they are all committed to violent extremism. Greener labeled dissenters as insurgency and called for them to be defeated like an enemy army. Greener suggested that Trump should be convicted at the upcoming impeachment trial as a national security imperative because so long as he is there leading the resistance, if you will, which he shows every sign of intending to do, he is going to be an inspiration to very violent people, end quote. Greener then compared Americans to Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, noting that in Afghanistan, quote, the thrust of our campaign there was, yes, to hunt down Al-Qaeda, but primarily to remove the supportive environment in which they were able to live and to flourish. And that meant fighting the Taliban. I think that is the heart of what we need to deal with here. Right, so very, very important because if people who used to be in the government, who may, you know, more than likely still have influence, not over, over politicians, but people within agencies, if they're talking like this to, to defeat fellow Americans as if they're an enemy army using drone strikes or other type of um, measures used for the, for the terrorists, then you can bet your bottom dollar that more than likely we're going to start seeing drone strikes in the United States. How crazy is that? Something that we never thought could ever happen here is happening, or it could happen if this rhetoric does not get toned down and if lawmakers actually make some type of move to make something like that happen. That is the real problem here. That is the real uh, danger here. That So if you have heard this podcast, and you think that this would not happen, then think again, because the everything is ripe for it to happen. Now, I want to show you the second part of the video that I started this podcast with, this podcast with, with Ron Paul, about what he says about um, detaining Americans without due process and or killing them pretty much. And, um, and pay close attention, because later after that, I'm going to be showing you uh, a clip from... Um, from Lindsey Graham about what he said when they were discussing and debating the bill, you know, about a, a decade ago. All right. Here's the second part of Rand Paul. Will America only begin to regret our loss of trial by jury when the people have names like Smith and Jones? But mark your words, this is about people named Smith and Jones or people named David or Saul or Isaac or Ahmed, or Ibrahim. This is about all Americans and whether or not you will have due process, whether or not you will have the protections of the law. We are told though that these people are so evil and so dangerous that we can't allow trials. But trial by jury is who we are. Trial by jury is that shining beacon on a hill that people around the world wish to emulate. It's why people came here. It's why we are exceptional as a people. It isn't the color of our skin. It's our ideas. It's the right to trial by jury that is looked to as a beacon of hope for people around the world, around the world, and we're willing to discard it out of fear. It's a shame to scrap the very rights that make us exceptional as a people. Proponents of indefinite detention will argue that we are a good people and that we will never unjustly detain people. I don't dispute their intentions or impute bad motives to them, but what I will say is remember what Madison said. Madison said that if a government were comprised of angels, 
We wouldn't need the chains of the Constitution. We wouldn't need to bind your representatives and restrain them from doing bad things to good people if men were angels, if all men in government were angels, we wouldn't need these rules. But all men in government aren't angels now and never will be. And there is always the danger that someday someone will be elected who would take the rights away of the Japanese. It happened once. Who would take the rights away of Jews or the rights away of Arabs. We are told by these people who believe in indefinite detention that the battle is everywhere. Now, if the battle is everywhere, your liberties are nowhere. If the battle is without end, when will they return your liberties? When will your rights be restored if the battle has no end and the battlefield is limitless and the war is endless? When will your rights be restored? It is not a temporary or limited suspension of your right to trial by jury, but an unlimited, unbounded relinquishment of the right to trial by jury without length or duration. We are told that limiting the right to trial by jury is justified under the law of war. Am I the only one uncomfortable applying the law of war to American citizens accused of crimes in the United States? Is the law of war a euphemism for martial law? What is the law of war except for something to go around the Constitution? It's an extraordinary circumstance that might happen in a battlefield somewhere else but should not happen in the United States. Every American accused of a crime, no matter how heinous, should get their day in court, should get a trial by a jury of their peers. These are not idle questions. I believe the defense of the Bill of Rights trumps the concerns for speedy passage, even of a bill, which I generally support. 67 senators voted just a few weeks ago to include a provision in this bill that says you have a right to trial by jury. And it was plucked out in secret, in conference, despite the wishes of two-thirds of the senators in this body, Republican and Democrat, who were concerned about protecting the right to a jury trial. Many senators say, oh, well, we tried, we lost, they outmaneuvered us, they were sneakier than we were. I disagree, though, that we give up. I think the time is now. I think we make a statement. The fight is today. The subject is too dear. If a majority were today to stand up and say, you know what, the right to trial by jury is important enough to, de to delay the defense authorization bill for two weeks, I think it would be an important message to send. So today I stand and urge a no vote on what I consider to be a travesty of justice. Thank you, Mr. President. Hello, everyone. My name is Jose Prado. I'm a survival. I just want to let you know that this is the first half of this video that I'm doing because, you know, once I edit it and I, uh, and, you know, I added all the articles and the videos and everything like that, it turned out to be an hour and 20 minutes. So, of course, I'm cutting it in half, uh, you know, give or take a few minutes. But the point is that this is the first half of it. If you have not yet gone back and listened to the to the uh, first one, you know, the part one, part two A, part two B, I would really encourage you to go back because all this information put together really shows the bigger picture of everything that I'm trying to show you so we can prepare accordingly. All right, so please share this information with your friends and family throughout all your social media. Please subscribe to the channel, whatever, whichever platform it is that you may be listening this to, it will really help us. So again, my name is Jose Prado and remember, Always ready. The Man-Aid Survival Show.